welcome to Colonial Dorchester State Historic Site. My name is Ranger Mary, and today I thought I could give you a little virtual tour of our archaeological excavation we have going on here at the park. The um, Colonial Dorchester is a pretty special site in that it's an archaeological time capsule. It, the park itself preserves an entire colonial town that existed for about a hundred years. So from 1697 up until the Revolutionary War, this was a bustling town. I always imagine a, a few blocks of uh, downtown Charleston out here in the Somerville area. And that's what it would have been like here in the 1700s with businesses, uh, homes, churches, schools, um, uh, boats going up and down the river uh, with goods to buy and sell. It would have been a quite a different place than we have today because today we have this beautiful park setting. I'm sure on this video you're going to be able to hear the birds chirping. You can see the sunny um, trees in the background, but it would have been a very different place. And that's what makes this place special is that people who come don't always realize that just below the surface of the ground is this archaeological time capsule of the 1700s. And it's going to give us a lot of information about what life was like in this town uh, in South Carolina in the 1700s for those uh, colonists living here. Now, we use a lot of primary resources uh, in our research to better understand what was going on here in the past, who the landowners were, uh, buying and selling a property, what was going on with the church and the school and other businesses, uh, big events like the French and Indian War and the Revolutionary War and how it impacted people's lives. Uh, one of our best primary resource documents, the one that I reference the most on tours, is going to be the 1742 plat map. Now, this map here, you can see, uh, lists out 116 quarter acre lots. You can see the roads of the town. It was very well organized and how it was laid out. And then where I'm standing right now, I'm standing right at this lot here. It's lot number 52. And I'm right um, in front of the market. So the grassy space behind me is that marketplace there. Now the site that I'm standing in right now is our current archeological excavation. This is lot number 52 in the town of Dorchester. It was owned by Joseph Blake, who was a wealthy plantation owner. Um, his family first arrived in the Carolina Colonies. It was his grandfather in 1683 who first arrived. But Joseph Blake Jr. is the one who uh, gets credit for owning this property in the town of Dorchester. He was born in 1700 and he uh, passes away, I believe, in 1752. Um, so he's the owner of this property. Our uh, excavation that we have going on here has been going on for a number of years. And I guess before I get into this specific excavation, we should talk a little bit about how it is that we know where to excavate in the park. People always ask me that questions and how archaeologists know where to dig. And archaeology starts with an awful lot of research, uh, looking at old maps and documents. Here at this park, we're lucky we already know there's an entire town here so it's uh, hard for us not to find things although sometimes we find things we weren't expecting and so what they've done is uh, they've taken this historic map and they've overlaid it uh, with an aerial map of the park get that out for you there you go so this is an aerial map of the park and you can see these uh, black rectangles on it that is just the 1742 map overlaid on um, the landscape today. This here is going to be Dorchester Road. You can see the Ashley River as well. Now, the yellow dots that you see on this map represent shovel tests. So they've laid out a grid, um, an imaginary grid over the park, and they've dug a shovel test every 20 meters. And a shovel test is just a really small uh, test hole. It's uh, 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters here. So about a foot and a half by a foot and a half. And they'll excavate uh, that uh, shovel test to see if they can uncover any artifacts, any evidence um, of structures or uh, people living there in the past. And uh, they'll keep digging down until they run out of artifacts and they uh, hit the sterile soil uh, layer um, in the ground. And that's how this site was found itself. It started off with the shovel test um, in the excavation. And uh, they dug down that shovel test 
and uh, the first thing that they uncovered, uh, they came down upon uh, lots of artifacts and they came upon this poorly laid floor. And I always call this a poorly laid floor, but I'm sure the person who put it down would be offended by that. I just think that this floor is a little bit uh, messier in its design than this floor here, because when the shovel test was dug and they kept digging down past this uh, layer of brick, they found this well laid brick floor. And that got the archeologists wondering what was going on here at this site. Why would this building even have two floors? And so after that shovel test, they started um, slowly working on this excavation uh, back in 2011. So we've been working on this site for about um, nine years uh, now. It seems like a long time. Uh, lots of stuff changes with the park over that time. But uh, we're very careful in our excavations. We're doing all steps in the process of archaeology simultaneously. So when you don't see us excavating out here, we're probably in the lab processing the artifacts that we have uncovered. Uh, for it. In addition, since we don't have any uh, real rush with our excavations, we're not worried about them building a road here or anything like that, we're able to go slow and give you the greatest opportunity to come and see this excavation for your site, uh, for yourself, before we uh, finish the excavation and we need to uh, fill it back in or in some other way preserve it. Now, looking around the site, we've got a lot of it uncovered um, in those years. So we've got our poorly laid floor level, our well laid floor level that I'm standing on right now. Uh, behind me, this brick wall here is the exterior wall of the building. Um, it starts to uh, step down here just because those bricks were taken. Uh, it's one of the tricky things here at the park is that after the town was abandoned, because it only existed for about 100 years from 1697 until just after the Revolutionary War in the 1800s, since no one was living here, you've got lots of building resources such as this brick. Uh, people came by and they helped themselves to the brick that was here to build structures elsewhere, say in the town of Somerville. So while I've got this exterior wall here, uh, I'm missing other walls in the building. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, what we did uh, discover here based on the artifacts though is that we think that this is the kitchen uh, building on the property um, on that quarter acre lot that the Blake owned, and that's just really based on the artifacts that we found. Uh, we found lots of um, uh, parts of cooking kettles, we found ceramics, we found um, utensils, uh, lots of butchered animal bones, things that have to do with food preparation. So that's where we're coming up with this interpretation of it being a kitchen. It could be that as we continue on our excavation, um, we'll discover something that completely changes our interpretation. It's an ongoing uh, investigation that we have here. But looking at the site the way it is now, uh, you can really see the layers of soil uh, quite well. Uh, this is gonna be a brick building. It had finished plaster walls. Uh, it had uh, glass windows as well. And here you can see the layers of the soil uh, quite well. And um, you can see as they were excavating down, um, they excavated through this layer here of, uh, of light brown soil. They would have found some artifacts here. And then they ran into a heavy layer of brick rubble and mortar um, from whenever the building collapsed. We know it's some, we don't know exactly what happened to the building after the town was abandoned, but we know that the building collapses and we know that it collapses in this direction. Uh, so we're digging through all of the rubble uh, brick that would have uh, composed the walls of that building. So they have to dig through this layer of rubble and then you get down to this darker brown soil layer here, uh, which would be the interior of the building. Um, and uh, find some artifacts that have to do with the, the kitchen area in here till we reach that poorly laid floor. Now, the reason why we think that there are two uh, floor layers, uh, which is an excellent question, and I oftentimes wonder about that whenever I'm thinking about the site, uh, is that at some point in the 1700s, this building was destroyed. If it's a kitchen house, it's pretty common for kitchen houses to burn down. So that might be what happened to this site here. So at some point, uh, the building was destroyed in a storm or a fire. Um, the rubble was evened out. They put a layer of brick on top of it, and then they continued using that kitchen building uh, to prepare food uh, up until uh, the owners of the property are going to move around. Because in this uh, kitchen house here, you are going to have an enslaved worker, uh, most likely living and working in the same location. Um, 
uh, preparing that food for the owner of the property, uh, Joseph Blake, who would have uh, resided in a separate building on this property when he was in the town, if not on one of his, uh, if he wasn't at one of his uh, plantations that he owned. He did own, uh, he did get his wealth from uh, plantations and he owned multiple plantations in the area. If you're familiar with the Somerville area, maybe you're familiar with the Newington neighborhood and the Newington Elementary School, that was where one of Joseph Blake's plantations was located in the 1700s. So now that we know a little bit about the history of the site um, and the archaeology that we're looking at, we'll continue learning about the process of archaeology uh, as we look around this site. All right, so we've come over to uh, where we're currently working on our excavation. Uh, we worked all last fall on this. Spring's been a little bit trickier to, to get the time out here. Uh, but we've come down about 40 centimeters in our unit. And I thought here we could talk a little bit about the steps in archaeology. Before we begin though, I think I should ask the big question of, do you know what an archaeologist does? Well, archaeology is the study of uh, humans of the past and the artifacts, the, the culture, the stuff that they leave behind. And an artifact is just something that's been used or altered by humans in the past. So here at Colonial Dorchester, I'm interested in what colonial life was like, what the 1700s were like, for folks living here in the town of Dorchester. And that's what my artifacts are going to focus on. So I wanna know what day-to-day -day life is like. Now, whenever I come out here to the field to work, I've got some important but simple tools to be using. So I've got uh, my trowel, which is probably the most important tool that I have. You can see that it's got long straight sides that come up to a point. It's very flat. Um, you might know it from other professions that use that trowel. Uh, but this trowel I'm going to use to uh, remove the soil. Now when I use the trowel, I don't uh, dig in the dirt like I do in my garden at home. I'm not sitting there uh, digging down, but I'm very methodical because archaeologists use the scientific process. Uh, we come up with a hypothesis and research questions, and only when those questions aren't answered by historic documents are we ever going to choose to excavate because archaeology is a destructive science. And once I excavate, I can't go back and re-excavate. Um, I read uh, someone came up with an analogy that it's a lot like reading a book and tearing out the pages as you go along. You can't go back and reread those pages if you're tearing them out of your book. And I can't go back and reread the soil once I've removed it. So I want to be very careful when I'm excavating and I want to make sure that I'm taking a lot of notes. Now here at Colonial Dorchester, our excavations are typically done in uh, one meter by one meter uh, squares. That's just our standard excavation. And as we dig down, uh, we might dig in an arbitrary depth of every 10 centimeters uh, if we're just starting to, uh, uh, starting an excavation, trying to figure out what's going on. So I've got my trowel and when I use my trowel, I'm just using the long edge of it. Remember, I'm not digging like a shovel in my garden and I'm slowly gonna peel back the layers with the edge of the, of the trowel. I can take some time depending on how uh, hard the soil is, so I want to carefully remove those layers so that I notice any artifacts that might be coming up. This one here looks kind of interesting. It might be a, a pipe stem that's just starting to uh, come up to the surface here. So I'm just going to carefully remove the soil around it as we're digging down to our depth for this unit here. Now the other tools that I have, I've got um, a, a scoop. and a broom. And those are really just so I can sweep my dirt into my scoop. And then I, I use my bucket, I pour it in my bucket so I can take it over to the screen later. Um, I've got root cutters, which is gonna be important as I'm digging down in case I run into um, any uh, roots. Uh, I always have a ruler with me so that I know exactly how deep it is uh, under the ground that I'm, I'm digging because I want to go a very specific depth at a time. So I always have a ruler and to help me know the depth in the center uh, for my other tool here, I do have a, a line level too that I'll use to make sure that the center is the same depth as the sides that I have. Uh, anytime I come out into the field, I, I'm taking very careful notes. Um, I always have my field notebook with me 
that I feel uh, with details about what it is I'm finding in my excavations. Uh, anything I think is unusual, who was helping me out that day, I'm gonna keep in my uh, notebook so that when I type up my report, I have something to reference. Um, every level that I dig, so if a level is 10 centimeters uh, in this particular unit, um, I've got another form that I'm going to fill out talking about what it is I found, the artifacts that I uncovered. Did I take a photograph of the unit? Because I want to document that. Um, I also draw the unit by hand, uh, making sure that I have those uh, details recorded because once I uh, have excavated it, remember I can't go back and re-excavate it. And uh, folks in the future might come up with a research question that I didn't ask. And maybe if my notes are detailed enough, they'll be able to use that resource. Um, the other thing that I use is I've got to document the soil color that I have here. So I've got this color book that I'm always using uh, that's got pretty much every shade of soil uh, that you'll find here um, in the world, here in South Carolina, uh, in the low country. It's usually on one of these pages here, but I'm going to match up the soil colors that I have here. I wanted to show you this unit because I, it has a lot of different colors uh, of soil. And it has something that people don't usually see. Uh, lots of people think of artifacts when they think of archeology, span uh, finding it, like my, uh, my pipe stem that's coming out here. This is what you think of when you think of archeology, span um, is going to be this pipe stem. I'm just gonna pull that out for you. Uh, so it's just gonna be from a smoking pipe. Um, but right next to it, this section here, is also an artifact. And this is what we would refer to as a feature, which is an immovable artifact. And so this feature is going to tell me about the activity of people in the past. And so this feature here, you can see this is lighter soil. This is darker soil. Um, and I've got a layer of clay right in here. This is uh, clay, it's dried out a little bit. And so, and then I have brick from, from a wall that's right here. So when I look at this, what I see is I can see that I've got this wall here. I've got this trench that was dug to construct the wall. And then it looks like maybe somebody uh, in the past uh, dug a hole here, or maybe I had a root here um, that's gonna have this dark uh, soil. Uh, it's a little bit disturbed here. So I actually know since I worked on this excavation here that this is going to be the trench that was dug. There's not a lot of artifacts found here. Um, I know here that uh, someone dug um, in the 1800s. I found some more modern artifacts in this section here. And then I've got the this hard clay, which is the edge of the building. Um, we're right on the edge of that, of that building that you saw uh, from the other segment. Um, from the introduction of it. And so where I'm kneeling, I'm kneeling where the east wall of the structure should be. Um, it appears that it was robbed at some point in time. And right behind me is going to be that poorly laid floor. So as we continue um, on our excavations, um, we're going to continue digging down and so hopefully you can reach that uh, well laid floor to see if it's there. So we're about halfway through um, excavating this unit. Now, when you walk around historic sites, and it's always really good to make sure that you understand the, the local rules, the, the federal rules that go along with ex, um, archeological sites, because oftentimes they're protected and we're protected here. We're a state historic site. Um, so if you're ever walking around and you happen to, to find something that maybe the rain has uh, brought out of the soil, you might find a pipe stem like this. It's really important that you leave that artifact where you found it and let one of the rangers here know, uh, like me, the archeologist, because where an artifact is, is going to change the story of it. This is a pretty interesting pipe stem. Uh, we can figure out uh, what um, decades it was made in. Uh, we know it's made out of a, of a white kaolin clay. Uh, but we can find out what decades in the 1700s it was used to see what style pipe was being used. But um, finding this pipe here, finding this pipe right next to my, right by my builder's trench, well, that starts to tell me a more complete story about what it's, what's happening here. And the deeper I'm digging, the older my artifacts should be getting. So if you 
remove an artifact from its location, while it's a cool artifact, it loses the story that it's going to tell. Whereas if you leave an artifact where you found it, you're gonna help add to that story. Because as I'm excavating down here, I, you know, I might find some pull tabs in Easter grass from the 1960s when people were out here um, having picnics. Um, and then as I start to get deeper, I'm going to start to find colonial artifacts. And the deeper I go, the older the artifacts I find should be. So if I find an artifact that doesn't fit in with the time period, like I found over here, then I'm going to know that something else is going on. And that's going to be important uh, for that story. Remember, I told you that this is going to be a kitchen, um, a kitchen residence, and it's because of the artifacts that we found here in this place, um, those uh, cooking kettles, the butchered animal bones. Uh, finding them here helps complete the story of what that person's life, who the, per the enslaved person who's going to be living and working in the kitchen house might have been like. Because I won't necessarily have a historic document that's going to give me much information about that person if I have any historic documentation at all. Uh, but the artifacts that they leave behind are going to help fill in those clues. Another way to think about archaeology is to think about your trash can at home. And so if you uh, think about your trash at home, you've been throwing out trash all week long. You're getting to the uh, end of the week and it's time for your trash to be picked up. Well, if I would go to your house and look through your trash, um, I would... I would find out what it is you've been eating all week, maybe projects that you've been doing in your house, maybe projects you were less successful with and you had to uh, throw out that, that practice thing that you were doing that didn't quite work out. But I'm gonna learn an awful lot about you and about your life. And that's what we're finding out here uh, with our excavations. Uh, digging through, finding those artifacts, it's stuff that's left behind. It's stuff that people didn't take a lot of care um, to make sure it was preserved. And so it fills in those gaps that historic documents um, and histories don't always um, have uh, preserved in their accounts because it's not something that people are thinking about uh, when they're um, writing those documents. And some people couldn't write those documents, uh, particularly in the 1700s, and a slave worker wouldn't have been able to, uh, to uh, be permitted to read and write. And so archaeology is going to provide us clues about that past. So now you've uh, seen this excavation site, you know about features, you know about the importance of artifacts in their context, uh, you know about the tools of archaeology um, and all the notes that, uh, that I take during the process of it. So now that I've uh, uh, finished this one here and I've got my bucket of dirt, I should put my, uh, put my pipe stem in there, I don't want to lose that. Uh, we're going to take this uh, bucket of dirt and we're going to sift it out and see what artifacts uh, were excavated in this unit. Okay, so we've come over to our screen uh, from the unit that we just excavated over there. And this screen is just going to help us sift out the loose dirt from the artifacts themselves. Uh, this particular screen is as quarter inch mesh, so it's got some bigger holes in it. If I'm looking for some really fine stuff, I might use something closer to the screen you have in your window to make sure that I'm catching all those really fine things. But given the layer that we are excavating, I think this one will do just fine. I've got our bucket of dirt that I excavated. We'll pour it into the screen. And then we will just sift it back and forth. So, got my trowel to help break up any dirt cloths that might uh, be in there. So I'll break up those dirt cloths, get it another shape. Take a look at what it is we found. So looking in here, uh, remember we're digging in a, in a brick building. So I'm going to find lots of chunks of brick in my excavation. And that's what I'm finding in my screen. Uh, lots of uh, pieces of that brick rubble. Um, I'm not seeing too much mortar. Mortar is going to be what holds those bricks together. Now let me just clear out some of this brick so we can get a, a better look at the other types of artifacts that we find here. Uh, in our excavation site. Uh, it looks like all of these artifacts are going to date to the 1700s. It's usually about the mid 1700s. Now we find lots of different uh, types of artifacts uh, in our kitchen, but still having to do with that food preparation um, and just everyday life. 
um, in the colonial times. Looks like I got a piece of a root. Okay, so we've cleaned it up there. I just missed the bucket. I'll pick it up in a minute. But let's see, we've got our, oh, here's our pipe stem that we found in the excavation site. So it looks like we've got a couple different pipe stems uh, that are showing up in our screen. Um, I've got different types of ceramics. And uh, these two are both from England. Uh, we've got some creamware, um, some uh, English brown stoneware. Uh, this is gonna be kind of your everyday dish. Uh, this one's gonna be more of your storage jar where you're gonna keep um, maybe your flour um, and other uh, supplies. I've got several different pieces of glass. Um, I've got window glass and bottle glass. We got a couple oyster shells that are gonna be part of the mortar. Uh, this here looks like um, a bowl of a uh, for a pipe, uh, a smoking pipe. I've got lots of different nails um, that would be holding that structure together. Now, uh, with this uh, pottery, we'll talk about it later. They do come from uh, all over the world. Uh, here's a piece of a uh, Chinese porcelain that's kind of special to uh, find. So that would be some of their fancier. Um, ceramics that they would have. It would certainly be expensive to bring something all the way from China in the 1700s. And so uh, when we look at pottery at this particular site, they found over 50 uh, different types of pottery uh, just in this excavation. So uh, they had lots of different types of dishes and bowls, uh, pots that they would have been using. And uh, this piece here is actually a piece of uh, Kelowna ware. Uh, this one here is gonna be made right here in South Carolina. So that's always exciting to find um, in our excavation. So now that we've kind of screened out our artifacts, it's time for us to uh, bag them up and take them back to the lab so we can wash them and, and take a closer uh, analysis of them. I always have my, uh, my bag with me during my excavation and it's gonna tell me where I was digging, which unit I was in, how I screened it, uh, and the date and the level that I was excavating. But I'm just gonna put all these artifacts in the bag. We'll take them back to the lab and uh, we'll continue our, our tour there and learn a little bit more about what we find here. So for our next step in the process of archeology, span we've come in from the field and we're here in our lab and I've got a couple different examples for you. Remember when we finished uh, sifting all of our artifacts uh, in the screen, we put it in a, in a label bag to bring back here. So once the artifacts are brought back to the lab, uh, we're gonna use our sink uh, to wash uh, all of those artifacts and uh, have them uh, dry out. That might take a couple of days, a couple of weeks, really just depends on, on the weather and, and what else is going on. Sometimes it just depends on when I'm able to get back to that sorting. Uh, once the artifacts are dry, uh, the tray is gonna look like this one here. Um, this one's got a variety of different artifacts. It's from the same area uh, that we were excavating, just uh, one unit over. Uh, these trays behind me also are from the same unit. So you can see uh, the amount of mortar, uh, brick. Uh, we've, I've already uh, removed a lot of brick uh, from these trays, but um, you can tell we've got bones, I've got oyster shells, I've got plaster, um, I've got different types of pottery. So all of these need to get sorted uh, into different types. So that's what this tray is showing, um, a different unit, but all of these artifacts have been uh, sorted. And um, after the artifacts have been sorted into different types, so we've got our, our nails, our plaster, our bone, this is a button, uh, some bottle glass, um, some Staffordshire slipware. Uh, these are oyster shells. Uh, those artifacts, uh, each group will be counted. Um, oyster shells aren't a good example because I don't count them. But they'll, they'll be counted and they'll all be weighed uh, using the scale. So this is going to be their artifact tag. Um, I forgot to mention that uh, we had that bag labeled out in the field uh, that talked about the location of it, um, of the unit. And then that location is given a provenience number. And that's what uh, this number is here. Uh, that number, this one is 3181, is gonna be associated with all of these artifacts in this particular unit dug at this particular depth. So all of this information is gonna be transferred um, from the field into the lab on each artifact as well. 
So we've got our artifacts labeled and weighed here. We used our scale. Uh, once I've uh, done this step, the next step is to uh, bag the artifacts. Uh, once again, we've got our label uh, with the artifact count and weight, uh, the type of artifact it is. Uh, these have been given their catalog numbers um, and they're put in that labeled bag. So we've got the location it was, or the park it was at, the uh, exact location, the depth, and then the provenience numbers right here uh, with the cataloging number as well. Um, once I've gotten to this stage uh, where everything's been um, counted, weighed, and bagged, I'm going to get out my uh, paper cataloging sheets to fill this out uh, and take these sheets over to the computer. It's just not convenient uh, to do it uh, from the bag. And it's always good to have a paper record as well as a digital record. But I'll enter all that information into the computer uh, so then I can go into a deeper analysis, uh, do some calculations on uh, the volume of artifacts, the types of artifacts that I am finding. Behind me here, I do have uh, a few different artifacts that I thought you might be interested in. I know I've mentioned uh, a few times that the types of artifacts that we find at lot number 52, our current excavation site, all of these artifacts have been found at that excavation, just in different units and different levels. Uh, but these are those typical types of artifacts that I was talking about. And we've got our uh, parts of a cooking kettle. Uh, we've got bottle glass. We've got butchered animal bones. Um, lots of different ceramics from all over the world. I've also found some pins and thimbles, uh, some buttons. Uh, I've even found um, fish scales, which I think are really cool because I didn't know fish scales could survive in the ground that long. But in some units, I'll find uh, lots and lots of fish scales, which makes sense because they would be fishing in the river um, and eating the bounty that they find there. Now, these artifacts here, they tend to be pretty small. Um, so I had some uh, bigger artifacts to show you. Uh, this one here is going to be from England. Uh, it's just a Staffordshire uh, slipware. Uh, this one here is a creamware from England. Uh, this is a type of pearlware, also from England. And uh, this one here is a redware uh, from England as well. Um, so you've got four different types of pottery all coming from England. Uh, they're going to have different purposes uh, within the home, whether it's going to be a finer tea set, uh, everyday dishes, uh, finer uh, dishes. I've got a piece of Chinese porcelain, um, so not from England, from China. Um, those are going to be some of their finer dishes. Um, I've got a piece of uh, Delftware. Delftware often uh, at this period of time in the 1700s was going to be uh, come from Holland, so from the Netherlands. Um, this piece of pottery here I picked because it's got such a brilliant pattern. This is a type of stoneware. It's a Rhenish blue and gray, and it's just going to be a, a type of uh, utilitarian. Um, it's a storage jar, basically. Uh, sometimes uh, th these pieces of pottery uh, can also be useful in the home, whether it's going to be uh, for pitchers for washing your face, for storing water, or even a chamber pot uh, tucked under the bed. I've got this larger bottle section because I've got a real small pieces of bottle glass that I, that I found in this particular unit. Uh, we usually don't find a, a whole bottle. This particular one was found by a, a diver in the 1970s. Uh, but uh, that is going to be the types of bottles that we find here. Now we've got our artifacts all, all labeled um, in the bags. But the next step in research is going to be labeling each individual uh, piece of artifact so that we can try and uh, piece together a whole dish that you would see if you know we had a museum here. And that's the goal. Right now our artifacts are usually offered uh, for researchers who want to compare our town site to another excavation site in South Carolina or a nearby state. Uh, but we hope that at one point in time, we're gonna be able to display our co uh, collection in a museum here at the park and not just in my mobile displays that I bring out whenever we are having a, an event in the park. So you can see from the pottery that it's going to come from all over the world. Um, whenever I think about the pottery here, uh, the ceramics, because we find so many different types of ceramics, for me, it's really just talking about the world trade that we have. The fact that I can find uh, Chinese porcelain, which would be expensive in the 1700s, uh, here in the town of Dorchester, shows me how connected uh, the Carolina colonies are going to be to the rest of the world, and that the people here living in the town were wealthy enough to afford to have this imported, um, in addition to uh, more utilitarian ware coming from Germany or um, from the Netherlands, 
from England as well. Um, I also have some pieces of uh, South Carolina uh, pottery that uh, Colono wear. Uh, this is most often going to be made by uh, an enslaved uh, worker, so an enslaved African. Uh, sometimes it's going to have a Native American influences too, so researchers kind of go back and forth on which one it is. But given my location and the time period, I would guess that this piece of pottery was made by an enslaved worker here in the town of Dorchester. Uh, the final artifact that I want to show you, because we have the advantage of this virtual tour for you, um, is one of my favorite artifacts from Lot 52 that was found, and it's going to be this fork here. It's just a bone-handled fork. It's a little too sensitive to, to bring out for events, but I think it's a pretty uh, nifty find uh, that they had here, and uh, pretty exciting to see how different their forks are than our forks are today. So looking at all these different types of artifacts, uh, we're better able to see what it is people found important, what they were using in their everyday lives. And there's a lot of different steps in this process of archeology span that go beyond just simply um, excavating uh, in the ground. So all these steps are going to take uh, many hours of work, adding up to many days of work as well. So this is oftentimes what uh, takes the most time in archeology. span but it's definitely going to yield a lot of great information to help us better understand what was going on here in the town of Dorchester in the 1700s and what life in colonial South Carolina might have been like. So I've taken you through the uh, steps in the process of archaeology uh, from out in the field to here in the lab. I did pre-record this to help us uh, get through the steps in the timely manner, but if you do have any questions about the process of archaeology or about Colonial Dorchester State Historic Site, just feel free to put it in the comments and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. But I thank you very much for coming along this uh, virtual tour of the site. It's been a fun time.